This is Carolyn Matthews's house, an ordinary home in an ordinary suburb. And as darkness falls, with neighbours settling down for dinner, Carolyn's husband Kevin and their three sons return from the video store. Carolyn is in the kitchen. But in this, the dead heart of winter, things are not as they should be. Lying in a pool of her own blood, Carolyn has been brutally murdered. What you've just heard is real. The actual triple O call made moments after Kevin and the boys found Carolyn. 13-year-old Shane and 12-year-old Daniel can only watch as their older brother Kenny attempts to resuscitate their mum. But to no avail. Breathe again. The boys went into the house first, found their mother lying in that state. Um, the older brother, um, he, he commenced CPR. Wouldn't that help her? They're all involved in life-saving. Again! In fact, Carolyn had even uh, right. had taught the boys CPR. <clears throat> Seeing their mother dead on the floor then trying to revive her, it uh, would have been an absolute horrendous experience for them. It's uh, a horrendous experience for anybody to go in and see that, but for young lads like that, you know, they, they did a wonderful job to try and save their mum. It's not clear exactly when Carolyn died. Perhaps she was hanging on while her sons tried to save her life, using techniques she herself had taught them at the local surf lifesaving club. Perhaps she was already gone. What is known for sure is that by the time the police arrived at 6.17, moments before the ambulance crew, blood loss from the nine stab wounds had proven lethal. Carolyn had been home alone for just 20 minutes. The crime scene is as baffling as it is shocking. A suburban housewife brutally stabbed to death in her own home. You wonder why a woman such as Carolyn Matthews had been targeted uh, and had been murdered for no apparent reason. Why? And most importantly, who? Homicides are generally between uh, men in their mid-30s, alcohol's involved or drugs, a dispute uh, or, or something of that nature. Uh, people generally who are already known to the police. But what you have here is none of that. What you have is a good suburb with a good family, a good mother, a good wife, and there are a lot of unanswered questions. And it's the violent nature of the crime and the unlikely profile of the victim that sends terror through the West Lakes community. Police have stepped up patrols in the area, with many residents now too frightened to be home alone. You start thinking to yourself, perhaps there's some uh, crazed person out there wandering around. Uh, if there is, is he going to strike again tonight? If so, where? The Major Crime Investigation Branch is painfully aware the murderer is still on the run. The assailant has killed once, and may kill again. The immediate thought is, well, who's responsible for this? Uh, why has it happened? Uh, are there any risks to the community? And uh, there's some urgency in finding the answers to those questions. The police, now on the scene in force, put the wheels in motion for a major investigation. With their uniformed colleagues door knocking and patrolling the area, the detectives cast their eyes closer to home. In any murder, the immediacy is the preservation and the processing of the crime scene. Whilst that's in hand, the next step is to identify and interview any relevant person. Kevin and the boys are taken to Port Adelaide Police Station to give witness statements. 
Kevin, I want to make it quite clear to you that you are not under arrest for anything and you're not suspected of any offences. Yes, I understand. Now, did you make any calls home today? Yeah. I rang to say I was on my way home. We were told that at approximately uh, 5.30, just after 5.30, um, Kevin Matthews had arranged to pick up his three sons, uh, asked them to be at the front of the house. He was going to take them to the uh, nearby video store to, for each of them to uh, hire a video for the night. Uh, he had pulled up, the boys got in the car. Come on in. Up in the movie shop. Yeah. And you know what you're going to get? Yeah. Alan Squish up. All right. Let's go. Then on to the uh, video shop uh, where he stayed in the car. The three boys went in and got a tape each. Uh, and they returned home roughly some 20 minutes later. Most crimes are solved within the first 48 hours. The police need answers and fast. Officers must yes. ask the tough questions to have any chance of catching Carolyn's killer. Kevin, this is a very difficult question. Have you ever had an affair? No. But I have been accused of one. On the night of the murder, when uh, Port Adelaide CRB interviewed Kevin, he, um, he was asked lots of things um, by the detectives to find out whether there's any motive or reason for this, uh, for the attack on Carolyn. Well, whether they, they had enemies, whether they've had trouble recently with anyone else, or they owe money, anything like, along those lines. He um, gave the appearance, he, you know, he spoke to him, he was <gasps> sobbing and breaking down and that sort of thing. It looked to me like he was, uh, you know, his guy's wife's been murdered, he was pretty upset by it all, yeah. The facts check out. Security footage from the video store confirms the boys were there at the time of the murder. Police interview Shane. This is his actual witness statement. Officers keep searching for a motive. Why Carolyn? Why the Matthews family? Now, your mum and dad get on well with the rallies, do they? Or yeah. Do they? Oh. Oh. There's no feuds anywhere? No. Dad hasn't bought into a business or anything recently? Mum. No, he got demoted from his job to store manager because... It's a truism a backed by stats that family members commit a large majority of murders. So as a matter of routine, the spouse comes under close scrutiny. Um, that, I mean, that wouldn't have made any financial problems for you guys or anything? No, because you're still getting paid the same. Oh, so the money didn't change, no. How do they normally get along? Oh, good. So there's no major dramas in that, right? no? No. The marriage is generally good? Yeah. A happy family and a watertight alibi. It was clear Kevin could not have committed the murder. And that leaves detectives back at square one. They begin by evaluating the crime scene in minute detail. As I approached the front door, there were some rubbish, pieces of rubbish strewn around uh, in the vicinity of the front of the door. As you walk in, there was numerous photographs and trophies relating to uh, life-saving, um, which obviously the, the family had all had won at some stage of their lives. And then we go into the kitchen, and, uh, and that's what actually the scene was. The crime scene was, in its own right, evidence of struggle, evidence of Carolyn moving after being injured, and um, as more details became available. There was a scene of where she tried to defend herself and used everything within her means to defend herself. Um, and what that brings to mind is a person that's fighting to her death. Uh, the crime scene certainly supported that scenario and, and um, uh, that is something that we've got to remember that the children were the first ones to see that scene. And I don't think it's anything that the investigators can forget, and certainly not the children. 
and there was just just blood everywhere, like uh, pools of blood all over the floor. There's blood squirts all over the walls and all over the ceiling, and it's just I, hard to comprehend how much blood there was. It was really difficult to see. Yeah, something that I'll never ever forget. Anyway. The forensic experts take DNA samples and scar every inch of the Matthews home for clues. And the first big step towards finding Carolyn's killer comes in the form of a boot print in the blood. A significant piece of, uh, of evidence, the, the footprint it was quite discernible. Um, uh, you can tell by looking at it, if you, if you found the boot, you would be able to match the boot with that print. It sort of indicated to me they were in a hurry to get out, perhaps. They didn't look around to see, have I left something here? Um, have I left some fingerprints? Have I left some footprints? Because obviously, if they had seen that, they, they would have made some effort to get rid of it, I would think. The print is large, consistent with the sort of boots commonly worn by tradesmen. They also find a frying pan. Police suspect Carolyn may have used it to try and defend herself. I would say her last few minutes would have been horrific. Extreme fear, shock and probably why, why is this happening to me? And out on the front lawn, three 20 centimetre knives, placed side by side with a strange, almost ritualistic neatness. Shane was the first to see them. As I was waiting in the front, uh, in the middle yard of the house, uh, I, was, I looked underneath a rose bush and found three knives under there, blood stained and whatnot, and I asked the police officer who I was standing next to, I said, oh, did you want me to grab them and, you know, grab them for you just so, yeah. And he said, no, just leave them there and, and, and yeah. So I think that sort of uh, widened up the crime scene. Uh, one of the knives in particular had, had what appeared to be blood on it. So we could uh, fairly well assume that it was, the, it was the murder weapon. And we established later that night or early the next day that the, the knives actually came from from the kitchen, from Caroline's own kitchen. So it indicated that whoever did this didn't come armed with a weapon. Robbery is still a motive being pursued by police. Detectives say one theory is a bungled housebreak. The victim's husband has told police nothing was stolen from the Westlake Shore home. The knives, more than anything, add weight to the emerging theory that this may have been a robbery gone wrong. And then there was this. Kevin's statement from the night of the murder. Kevin, has your house ever been broken into? Yes. How long ago? Perhaps the same burglar saw the kids and Kevin leave and thought the house was empty. The unarmed intruder startled by Carolyn simply grabs the nearest weapon to hand. Detectives present at the post-mortem hope Carolyn can tell them more. The post-mortem was um, long. We took most of the rest of the night. Uh, I can remember walking out and it was uh, 7.30 in the morning. The sun was up and shining. That's how long we'd been in there. And you could see that a lot of the number of the blows have been, and stab wounds have been delivered with substantial, substantial force by the depth of penetration of the wounds. She had a stab wound that was into her heart and one into her lungs. Her lungs and, uh, collapsed and um, and that's what she died from. And she bled internally, massively. <coughs> Again. Up. There was nothing more the boys could have done Again. to save their mother. Please hurry. The detectives finished their investigations of the home early yesterday afternoon and returned the premises to the grief-stricken family at about five o'clock. The father and his three boys were too distraught to make a public plea on camera. Carolyn inspired devotion from those around her. She was a busy mother, loving daughter and loyal friend. She had her own small sewing business and was a lifelong active member of the local surf lifesaving club. We coached oh, uh, probably 20 kids, 25 kids maybe. Um, so yeah, in various different teams. So uh, on that occasion, I, I, I guess it's uh, yeah, the teams that she was coaching did fairly successfully, and um, and yeah, then the, mod uh, the medals show that. So. 
and it was on the beach at the club that Carolyn and Kevin became childhood sweethearts. This heart-rending photo taken when they were in their teens. Carolyn, Carolyn. with this ring, I wed you, you with all that I have. All that I am. The young couple proclaim their love to the world forever, joyous and hopeful, but ultimately, seen through the eyes of hindsight, a tragedy in waiting. With the investigation stalled and DNA testing revealing no new evidence, detectives turn to the public for help. An appeal for information has already led to over a dozen phone calls to police. Detectives remain confident that someone holds the vital information they need to help catch the killer. And from one of those calls comes the explosive allegation. Kevin is having an affair. It's been two days since Carolyn Matthews was brutally stabbed to death at her home in Westlake Shore. The affluent outer suburb of Adelaide is in shock as police scour the neighborhood for clues. It's not an environment that is known in this state for uh, any type of serious criminality or any type of police attention. There's an undercurrent of fear. A murderer remains on the run. And all detectives can say for certain is this. Judging by the boot print left at the scene, the assailant is most likely male. We knew that with this one, because we didn't have a lot, that could, it, was going to, it could have been and it was going to be a long and difficult uh, investigation unless we got some solid information. Information does arrive. A public appeal for help leads to dozens of calls, most red herrings. However, all of the information is checked and chased, including the sordid allegation that Kevin is having an affair. It is essential for us to establish whether the, the information that we received is uh, accurate and correct or not. It may be that it's not accurate, it may be someone trying to disrupt the investigation, or it may be someone just being malicious, in this case against Kevin, uh, but in any event, uh, we had to establish whether the information was correct or not. Remember this? Kevin's statement from the night of the murder. Have you ever had an affair? I was accused, but I didn't. Can you categorically say that you did not have an affair? I can categorically say that I did not have an affair. If the accusation is true, that denial raises more questions than answers. In the first 48 hours, we do our normal checks. Um, a lot of it is phone records, because phone records can tell you a lot of things, you know, um, who is contacting who. Police trawl through Kevin and Carolyn's phone logs. And given the context of the alleged affair, something jumps out at them. For months now, Kevin has made a large number of calls to a recently separated, but still married woman, named Michelle Burgess. In itself, it's evidence of nothing. But it's a fresh line of inquiry, and detectives decide to look into Kevin and Michelle's past and present. We applied for telephone intercept warrants and listening device warrants. Uh, so all that does take a considerable amount of hours and, and work time. But as I say, at least we had some direction there. And that process begins with painting a portrait of Michelle. Michelle Burgess seemed to be your typical um, adult female from the, the northern suburbs. She seemed to be a typical mother of two. Uh, she was separated from her husband. With Michelle in their sights, it's not long before the team's inquiries and surveillance work pays off. Kevin and Michelle don't just have history, they're clearly still involved. You know, he might think, well, I'm not going to own up to this because it's morally wrong and my wife's been murdered and I don't want the, the world to find out about it. You don't, you don't book into a motel at 9.30 in the morning and out at midday because you were uh, with another person just because you like to drink tea and biscuits with them. Within about three or four days, we believed that Kevin Matthews was having an affair with Michelle Burgess. 
a view strengthened after a visit to Michelle's estranged husband, Darren Burgess. Confirming the affair, it was the reason they separated, Darren tells police Michelle ran up a $1,200 phone bill talking to Kevin and that Kevin gave his wife a gold necklace signed yeah. Chuck Loves Daffy. Kevin Matthews was, uh, was Darren Burgess' boss. Being in Bay Repairs, everybody knew everybody. Uh, and um, as a result of that, the evidence is that a liaison between Kevin Matthews and uh, Michelle Burgess took place. In an effort to join the dots, detectives visit the Port Adelaide bow repair store where Kevin works. A tradesman from across the street who knew Michelle says he saw Kevin and Michelle on the night of the murder in the company of a mysterious third man. Uh, they looked as if they were having an argument inside the premises uh, and they were all very agitated at the time. And it just happened to be that this person knew Michelle Burgess personally. It's all very tantalising. But a week into the investigation and the team's efforts has yielded no evidence of the murderer's identity. Attempting to keep the case in the public eye and perhaps even wrong foot the killer, police issue a media statement that they have not ruled out robbery as a motive for the killing. But behind closed doors, detectives have made the significant step of reframing the context of the crime on where we might be looking or where we might have to start looking changed uh, from just a random killing to look to me that though this is this is a personal attack a frenzied personal attack someone wants a dead for whatever reason it's hard to imagine anyone would want to harm carolyn and on the 19th of july hundreds of friends family and neighbors gather to pay their respects Remember not the tragedy of the 12th of July 2001, but the beauty of our sister, Carolyn. I wasn't, didn't squeeze a tear out at all at any point, um, probably because I was still in shock and, and didn't, yeah, didn't know what to feel. The size of the crowd, unable to squeeze into the funeral home, is a testimony to the impact Carolyn had on the lives of those around her. Her lifelong friend Kayleen was doing it tough that day. She was a very, very beautiful person and that they were very fortunate to have her as their mum. And then I still really miss her. And um, the connections that we had. Yeah, they are fortunate to have had her as their mum. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> After the service, back at the Matthews family home, and unwilling to let go of her friend just yet, Kayleen and her husband watch the wedding video with Kevin. <laughs> but what was once beautiful is now chilling. Carolyn loved lilies. She wanted lilies in her wedding bouquet, which is a bit ironic, the death flower for her wedding bouquet. Images of his recently murdered wife, young, carefree and happy, proved too much for Kevin. I've got to get out of here. What do you mean? I can't take it anymore. I've got to go. And as soon as he said that, all the boys just went to bed and shut their doors. Um, my husband and I were sort of just sitting there looking at each other like, what what just happened? Um, in the end, when he came back home finally after quite a few phone calls and I got quite shitty with him because I thought his behaviour was not very good considering the boys had just buried their mother, so to speak. Um, he should have been there for them and to be off out somewhere still drinking and... Just ringing me is, was just not sort of on. So I got quite abusive in the end and um, he finally did come home and I confronted him about having an affair and he got quite like um, 
no, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. Why would you even say that? And I said, it's because of your behaviour tonight. I said, you're not acting like you should be. And I said, something's not adding up. During the service, shoulder to shoulder with his boys, he played the heartbroken, stoic husband. Now, it seems, he's breaking down with grief. Or is he? Kevin Matthews and Michelle Burgess, after the funeral, continued to communicate with each other. He is a man that should be grieving for his, his wife and, and the mother of his boys, and he's, he's having all this contact with this woman and seemed to be more concerned about her well-being than, uh, than his own sons and, and wife. The continued surveillance of Kevin and Michelle, now including a tap on their mobile phones, takes the investigation into strange territory. Kevin likes to be called Chook and Michelle Daffy. But it seems Chook is not the only man in Daffy's life. We identified a relationship between David Key and Michelle. We had uh, evidence of them together. Um, we had evidence of him living with Michelle at her house. By extension, David Key is now a person of interest, and his record is very interesting. An ex-crim and drug addict, he's done time for armed robbery. He was just a small-time criminal from uh, out the northern side of town, northern suburbs. I don't believe he was very well educated. He didn't come across that way. Um, I think he had trouble even reading and writing. His chequered criminal history and relationship with Michelle is more than enough to pique the team's interest, and they step up surveillance. David Key is on their radar. It's not long before police get the breakthrough they've been waiting for. We knew that he was um, going to see Michelle on this particular day. However, as fate would have it, he was uh, intercepted by a uniform patrol, um, stopped for traffic offences. Um, he had some outstanding warrants, I believe. Uh, and he was apprehended on those traffic matters and warrants and was taken to the Elizabeth Police Station. Got the evidence from the Keane case here. Oh, good job. Back at the station, David's personal items, including his boots and wallet, are confiscated and covertly examined. They seized his boots, which he'd been wearing at the time. Um, they went through his property, through a wallet, and found a, um, a sheet of paper that related to, uh, to, to Darren Burgess. It had a photo of Darren on it and some particulars of where he lived and uh, his work address and, and uh, just personal, item, personal details. The investigators at the time took a copy of that, placed the original back in the wallet so as not to alert Michelle Burgess or David Key that we had a copy. Check this out. It's the content of the note that has even the most seasoned detective shocked. They are looking at a contract to kill Darren Burgess, Michelle's estranged husband. Dated? You just don't get contracts for murder written out as um, eloquently as this one was, with all the details, so you could quickly and safely come to the conclusion that Darren Burgess uh, was going to either have some attempt on his life or be killed uh, if um, David Key wasn't stopped. With this information, the police can't risk releasing David back onto the streets. They hold him on the strength of the traffic offences. Uh, just because David Key was in custody, what I'm saying here didn't mean that the contract had been uh, um, expired. It hadn't. Not in my view, it hadn't. The 26th of July, 2001, and police are on the trail of Carolyn Matthews's killer. They have a suspect in custody, David Key, a small-time crim with big-time aspirations. I just want a lawyer. I don't want to answer anything. I don't need to be here. I don't want to be here. Just get me a lawyer. In his wallet is a contract to kill Darren Burgess. Incredible as it seems, David Key is a hitman. That's amazing. The research that's been conducted into contract killing um, with the Australian Institute of Criminology uh, describe contract killing as where a person wants another person killed through hiring a third party and the instigator is not present 
at the murder and takes no part at the scene. The motives for these murders are horrific and often surprising. They range from amateur suburban slayings and professional underworld hits to vindictive family feuds. The issue with uh, contract killings and people's understanding of it is um, it's been, in a sense, romanticised by the uh, Hollywood movies and uh, media portrayals of uh, the Mafia and uh, Scarface and The Godfather. But um, in actual fact, the reverse is true. And the category of contract killing is mostly seen in the domestic situation. So David, can you tell me who contracted you to kill Darren Burgess? Listen, copper, I don't know what you're talking about. I've had enough of these stories, these fairy tales. I've got nothing to say to you anymore. Michelle Burgess arrives to collect David's personal effects. Unaware, police have confiscated his work boots and photocopied the note in his wallet. This is a confession. Police desperately need answers. Who issued the contract and who killed Carolyn Matthews? But Key is refusing to talk. His silence does not help his cause, because on the 2nd of August, the forensics unit has a massive breakthrough with two key pieces of evidence. The detectives, um, as part of their investigation, came across suspect, Mr Key, and they seized shoes from him. Those, sho those boots then came here to the, the section and we then compared those boots with the photographs we've taken at the crime scene. The boots were examined for blood, because obviously um, if they've left impressions in blood, we would expect to find some blood on the shoes. What we are able to show that not only did he have blood on his shoes, um, but the fact that his, his, uh, his uh, boots were actually, boot marks were found within the crime scene right next to the deceased. The tread of David Key's boots matches the print in the blood from the crime scene and DNA samples on the boots test positive for Carolyn's blood. David Key was at the murder scene. So at that stage, that was sufficient evidence for what we had uh, to charge Key with the murder of Carolyn Matthews. If David Key is a hitman, did someone hire him to kill Carolyn? You've got um, uh, David Key is arrested on the strength of the circumstances of the murder, the suspicions attached to him, and principally the DNA of Carolyn Matthews on his boots. And what that left was a very clear picture that he was one of the murderers, but certainly not the instigator. There was no connection between David Key and Carolyn Matthews, but there was when you brought in Michelle Burgess. Michelle Burgess is now a prime suspect. At the time of the murder, she was separated from her husband, living with David, and having an affair with Kevin. Michelle Burgess seemed to have some attract, uh, seemed to have the ability to attract males. Uh, she, you know, she had Kevin wrapped around her finger, and then she had David Key. I can't put my finger on it because I can't understand why or how. Police step up surveillance on Michelle. And during one of Kevin and Michelle's many clandestine meetings, detectives overhear Kevin telling Michelle, you're going Too down for it. Know. Too many people know. Could it be murder? We certainly knew, in my mind, I knew she was definitely involved, but I didn't want to take the risk of uh, uh, arresting her too early and then uh, subsequently uh, losing uh, out down the track because once you, you can't try her twice and you only ever get one crack at this thing. To tie Michelle to the murder, detectives need to link her to the contract note, then to David, and then to the crime scene. The team decides to make a move and issue Michelle with a warrant to search her house. My thoughts of her within probably the first five minutes was that uh, she was most definitely involved in, in the murder of uh, Carolyn Matthews and um, that I was going to uh, uh, be lucky enough at some stage to get sufficient evidence to lock her up and charge her with it. Michelle appears confident. I haven't done anything wrong. What are you looking for? 
but she doesn't know police have a copy of the contract found in David's wallet. Police keep searching. The house search confirms that David had been living with Michelle at the time of the murder, but there's no sign of the contract. What they do find is Michelle's diary. If the writing matches that of the contract, they'll know Michelle is the author. The jigsaw puzzle is slowly coming together. The tradesman from across the street's description of the mysterious third man from the night of the murder matches the identity of David Key. We had evidence of him living with Michelle at her house. Um, we also had evidence of him being with Michelle at the tire place on the, on the night of the murder. So once we had the evidence against David, uh, it was then obvious that we were, we, we were building up a case against Michelle. Two days after the house search, police get a massive breakthrough. The handwriting in Michelle's diary matches the writing on the contract note. Police are convinced they have enough evidence to arrest Michelle for murder. It was, uh, I don't know, about four o'clock in the afternoon when we went out there, uh, knocked on the door, and she was told she was under arrest. It came as quite a shock to her. She couldn't believe it. Michelle Burgess was led to the Adelaide Magistrates Court in handcuffs shortly before midday. The arrest of Michelle Burgess triggers a media frenzy. Reporters and news crews line the courtroom and witness a macabre twist, a display that, in the minds of detectives, highlights Kevin's involvement in the murder of his wife. Kevin uh, went to court the day after she was arrested. He had a, uh, had a, um, a wide brimmed like, cricket hat, white one. Um, he went into the court, sat uh, in the front row, I believe. He rolled the hat up and uh, it clearly uh, displayed the word forever in black ink written on the hat, the inside of the hat. Forever, from Chook to Daffy. It's an indescribable um, act of stupidity, but it sort of gave you an indication of the world that they were in, their world. Mr Matthews, can I just ask why you're in court today? No. An ordinary suburban father defending the very woman police believe killed his wife. It just doesn't make sense. There's been speculation, Mr Matthews, that you may be implicated. Do you want to reassure people that you're not? The media can smell a rat. Who killed Carolyn Matthews? To find out, detectives from the Major Crime Investigation Branch in Adelaide are uncovering a disturbing tale of blood, lust and lies. Three weeks after the brutal stabbing of Carolyn, both Michelle Burgess and David Key have been arrested and remanded. Police are convinced that Kevin Matthews, Carolyn's husband, initially viewed as a victim, is somehow involved. Once the evidence started to build up, it painted a, a much truer picture about Kevin. There's been speculation, Mr Matthews, that you may be implicated. Do you want to reassure people that you're not? In a move that further baffles detectives, Kevin makes an impassioned public plea. He issues a statement in the newspapers, denying his and his boys' involvement, claiming Michelle is innocent, and at the same time declaring, you just don't know what you've got until you miss it. You've got to scratch your head and wonder at a guy that would go public and say, the police have arrested the wrong person for the murder of my wife. That suggests, A, that he knows he did do it, and B, perhaps there might have been something between him and the arrested person. Absolutely bizarre to do that. And I think by, the, and by him doing that, and everybody that saw that, and the general feeling around the public was, that this bloke's uh, got something to answer for. But what's the extent of his involvement? Is he just another fly in Michelle's web? Or did he take some part in the killing? It was then a matter of trying to build up the evidence. We had some, but to build it, make it stronger against Kevin. Because Kevin not being at the scene made it a little bit more difficult. At the time of Carolyn's murder, Kevin and the boys were at a local video store. 
CCTV footage proves that. And what kind of father would allow his children to discover the body of their murdered mother? To piece it all together, investigators go back through all of the evidence, attempting to reframe the information and get a fresh perspective. As a phone contact between Michelle and, and, and Kevin that day indicated something was happening. There was numerous phone calls and, and SMS messages between the two of them all day long. We know that um, Michelle and uh, Burgess and uh, David Key left the workplace around about 5.30ish on that night. We also know that Kevin rang from the workplace to his home, to the landline there. Uh, that, that time was recorded. It was shortly after Michelle and David leaving. We know uh, that that call was to arrange the boys to be at the front and wait for him when he got home so that he could take him down to the video shop. So it was quite obvious that, that Kevin has made that call straight after Michelle has left, um, preparing the boys to get them out of the house for what's about to take place. The sheer unlikelihood of that neat 20-minute gap. Detectives have no direct evidence that Kevin orchestrated the window of opportunity, but all of the details, including the meeting with David Key and Michelle at Bow Repairs, are adding up to a damning conclusion. The meeting down at the uh, workplace, within a half an hour of his wife being killed, puts him too close, too close to the incident not to be involved in it. With Michelle and Key behind bars, fresh evidence is unlikely. So the decision is made to arrest Kevin. Sadly, the boys were there to witness their father being taken away. When I found out officially that he was involved, it was when um, uh, Kenny and myself were sitting in the lounge room and uh, some detectives come to speak to, to Kevin and, and I was speaking to him in the dining room and then he come in and uh, sort of said he was going down to the police station for a while and that he loves us and whatnot. And, and sort of Kenny and I joked to each other that, you know, he was probably going to be arrested or something. And, um, yeah, then after he left, the detectives sort of come in and told us that he was arrested and that, yeah, he wasn't going to be coming home anytime soon. With all three players under arrest, police now have to make the case rock solid. I, f I felt like we were always pretty good, on good ground with Michelle. There was a lot of evidence there. If we were ever going to lose one, it might have been Kevin. Detectives believe that David, Michelle and Kevin are responsible. But will they all get what they deserve? Investigators thoroughly sift through the details tightening and refining the case until they get their reward, a motive. They dig up financial records and discover Kevin has a $100,000 life insurance policy for Carolyn. It was taken out in 1996. Then, indiscretions inside prison mean Key and Burgess are separately heard discussing Kevin's role in the crime. Michelle and David look certain to go down. Kevin's case is not so solid. But on the eve of Key's court appearance, he rolls, pleads guilty, and turns crown witness. I would say that David uh, Key knew that there was insurmountable evidence against him um, in relation to the murder of Carolyn. I, I would think he, he saw that his only way to, to get a lighter sentence would be to plead guilty, assist the police, and give evidence against the uh, co-offenders. Look. I should have told you the truth from the beginning. Instead of sitting around here bullshitting to the two of you, all these fairy tales and lies I've been telling. When he stepped away from what he had done, I think he realised what it had been done to him by Michelle, and that he wasn't the second player in this, he was the third. So, I think David Key saw it now as a business and the business was how was he going to minimize his jailing and sentencing david did you stab carolyn matthews yes yes i did 
Part of the deal for a reduced sentence of 20 years was full and frank disclosure and complete cooperation detailing all of the events surrounding Carolyn's murder. Was Kevin Matthews involved? Yeah, yes, yeah, he was. What emerges is an explosive account of the dirty business of dollars for death. This murder is categorised as a contract killing on the basis that there are two people who solicit the services of a hitman. Kevin Matthews and Michelle Burgess, they in effect hire David Key to kill Carolyn Matthews. David, how were you introduced to Michelle Burgess? One of the mums from the school introduced us and we met for the first time outside the school. She asked me David Key was Sunday offered $50,000 for the murder of Carolyn Matthews and then also the murder of Darren Burgess. That was a promise that was made to him that um, was never delivered. Um, but the uh, $50,000 fee, it was presumed, would, would be part of the proceeds of a $100,000 life insurance on Carolyn's life. Were you having a sexual relationship with Michelle? Yes. Yes, I was. Were you living with her? Yes. I was living with her. As the interview progresses, several things become apparent. You know, she, she let me... Key is not the big-time hitman the bare facts of his crime would indicate. In fact, it seems that he too has been manipulated by Michelle. But then she said to me, if you love me, you'll kill her for me. I mean, what's a man meant to do? To me, it was a pawn that was used by uh, uh, Michelle, uh, and he got what he deserved because he was stupid enough to be sucked in by her and, and do what she wanted. And what she wanted was Carolyn killed. And then she says to me, it has to be done tonight. She told Kevin to go and pick up the kids and take him up to the video store. As Key corroborates each detail, the case against Kevin strengthens further. And by the time he and the kids got back, it'll be done. And the true horror of Carolyn's final few minutes emerges. When David Key and Michelle Burgess went to murder Carolyn Matthews, they knew that the coast was clear. They had their signal that Carolyn was home alone. They went to the door and Oi, David Carolyn Key Matthews. held up the contract to Carolyn Matthews and asked her if she was the person. And that Michelle punched her in the face. And I grabbed her. And she was screaming and screaming, I'd scream. What have I done wrong? Who are you? What's going on? Who sent you? All the time, all the time, screaming. I dragged her down the hallway. <laughs> what did I do? I don't understand. Shut up. <laughs> it's none of your business. Sorry. Shut know. your mouth. I don't know what I Shut your friggin' mouth. I'm sorry. What are you doing in there? Please. Sorry about it. I'm looking for something. Leave me alone. Please, let me go. I'm sorry. Shut up. I don't understand. Please, please, please. Wait. Just wait. Please. You'll see. Come on, let's do this. Come on, bring it here. Please, no. You're coming with me. No, they corralled her into the kitchen, and then the killing began. And it was something that you just can't imagine. She kept screaming at me, screaming at me, do it, do it. It just got too much, and I snapped. What is happening to her? She doesn't know. She's done nothing wrong. And, and, that, and the fear, I mean, uh, she's sustained defence wounds, so she's trying to protect herself. She knows what's about to happen. And I don't think there could be anything more scary than that. I 
got in the car and there was there was blood all over me, all over me, head to toe. So we drove down the beach and I went down the shore, washing it off me and washing every part of my body. I just felt I had to just, just keep washing and washing and washing. And I remember Michelle, she went up to the phone box and she called Kevin and she told Kevin, it's done. It's done. The telephone record showed that uh, there was a, a call made to Kevin Matthews' mobile phone shortly after six o'clock that evening, and that the call was only for a duration of about three seconds. Long enough for the caller to say, the job's done. It's a revelation even seasoned officers find difficult to come to terms with. He knew. Kevin knew what his kids would see when they walked in the front door. I think the act of um, Kevin Matthews returning to his house with his children, knowing that they would find their mother dead is an act that um, cannot be forgiven. In his mind, using the children was a shield to him. This murder was planned. It wasn't a spontaneous uh, act between two people. And every step of that planning, there was an opportunity not to involve the children. Despite all of Key's answers, a question still remains, the simplest and most profound. What the hell have I done? Why? You could be sidetracked by thinking this was about the relationship between Michelle Burgess and Kevin Matthews. But my view is this was all about greed, and the greed sat with Michelle Burgess and nobody else. With Key's testimony bolstering their case, police go to court confident. And on the 10th of August, 2003, a jury finds Kevin Matthews and Michelle Burgess guilty of murder. Justice Margaret Nyland sentences both Michelle and Kevin to life imprisonment with a non-parole period of 30 years. David Key's fate was already sealed. 20 years jail for his role in the murder. It's a crime that had more than one victim. People who do these things don't understand and realise the, uh, the grief that they cause to not only the, the person that's, that's been murdered, but to everybody else that's around and close to them. It upsets me um, a lot these days is that we, um, my brothers and I, have never sort of got a chance to become friends with, like, Carolyn or Mum, you know? Like, it's... I've seen all my mates and all their parents all get along and they, you know, go down to the pub and have a beer with their old man or, you know... They... It's not so much like a... a mother, father, child role. It's... Uh, created that friendship, I guess. And it's, yeah, I think that, well, I feel something that I've missed out on a lot and and I'm, sh I'm sure she would feel the same would be, yeah, just having that friendship and, and not having, have to, having, having to scream at us uh, because we've been naughty all the time, you know, just had to be able to appreciate our company a lot more. You know. Carolyn Matthews. Devoted mother, celebrated lifesaver, loving daughter, and loyal friend.
I think that he's sort of living in his own little world. He's living. Um, I don't think that he he knows that he's done something wrong. I think, but he doesn't want to say that he's actually done it.